We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Real quick question. Let's try to divide the room into a, a fight, all right? How many of you watched the ball drop like live? You stayed up past midnight last night, you're right? About half? Okay, how many of you were like went to bed before then because you don't really care all that much and your sleep is more important? All right, well, I was in the camp of uh, staying up late, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. So was our sound guy. Um, <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> I love it. Hey, well, hey, well, we're, well, we're gathered together, uh, what we do every Sunday, right? We open up God's word because we know that it is a source of truth, it is a source of life, and we want to look into it and apply what it says to our lives so that we can be more like Jesus. And that's why we do what we do on Sundays. We gather together, we offer worship corporately to our God, and then we worship through our, our time of communion together. We worship through a time of, of our offering together, and we worship through opening God's word and learning from it together. And so I want to invite you into that this morning. One of the things that I've noticed uh, that, that we always do at the beginning of a year, it's one of those opportunities that we have uh, just kind of a natural gift from our calendar to look at our life and say, where am I stuck? Where are some things that need to change? What are some things I could do differently in 2023? Have you noticed uh, that one of the worst feelings in the world when you're driving somewhere and you pull maybe into some soft grass, right? It's just been raining recently and you get your tires stuck. It's one of the worst feelings, right? Because you, you know your tires are spinning. You know that you're supposed to be moving somewhere. You know you're supposed to be moving forward. You're using up the gas. The engine's doing what it's supposed to do. But for whatever reason, you just can't get any traction. It's a terrible feeling. Especially if it's raining out and you know now you got to go out into the elements. You got to go out into the weather. You got to try to figure out how to get this car moving forward. And what happens when you spin your tires? It just gets worse, doesn't it? You just get into a deeper hole. And it becomes harder and harder to get out of it. Well, the truth is that sometimes at the very end of a year, you can look back at 2022 and say, man, there are some areas of my life where I am certainly stuck. I've been spinning my tires. I've been trying to work out some things. I've been trying to do some things. And I just find myself feeling more stuck than when I started. I want you to know that as part of the strategy of the devil— Part of the strategy of the evil one is to keep you stuck. In fact, the, the, one of the devil's strategies, Satan's strategy is just to, to weary the saints. If he can have us just spinning our wheels and going nowhere and just getting tired trying to do something good, trying to live out our purpose, trying to move forward, but actually accomplishing nothing, like that's like a prime strategy of Satan is to keep us weary and tired and stuck. And we don't want to do that. We want to be a people. We want to be a church that's moving forward, that's, that's constantly taking steps to become more and more like Christ, to fulfill the Great Commission, to live out the purposes that he's given to us. You know, in, in battle, there's, there's some, a, a battle strategy. It's, it's really twisted, okay? But think about this for a moment. If you're a, a, in a battle, a war, right, there's a difference between if you, if you kill someone across the enemy lines, well, it only takes, you know, one person to kind of go over. At that point, there's nothing they can do about it. It just kind of takes one person to pull that, that person off the battlefield. But when you wound someone, 
right? When you, when you cause someone to be wounded but not killed, now you got to take like three or four people off of your defense or offense, right? And you got to have them now worry about the wounded. If you think about it in a way that wounding someone in battle is sometimes a better strategy than killing anybody, because what you do is you, you, you take the, the people who are out there on a purpose, they're trying to fulfill a purpose, and you have them worry about and, and tend to other things. And what happens when we as a church find ourselves wounded and stuck, you don't really just affect yourself. When you're stuck, you're actually causing the whole momentum of the purpose and the mission of the church to slow down because you have other people gathering around you to help you get unstuck. So what can we do? And by the way, it's good to help your brothers and sisters get unstuck. It's a good thing to pull a wounded uh, friend off of a battlefield. That's all good. But what can we do to be healthy, to be unstuck, so that as a church we can move forward into 2023 full speed ahead? That's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at that. You see, we want to get unstuck. We want to, you know, reset, get a fresh start. Let's start another little battle here, all right? How many of you are, are PC people, all right? Your computer you got, the computer you prefer, and we got a few PC in here, all right? How many of you are Mac users, all right? All right, I was a PC user too before I got saved. <laughs> Shogun. Well, listen, you know, uh, if you're a PC user, all of us probably started with a PC, right? That's probably one of the first, um, maybe that's not true. But if you go back to like the really, really kind of original old, old computers, like you know that there's a, a key combination that you press when things go wrong, right? And it is what? Control, Alt, Delete. Now, you Mac users, you know that there's a different. I think it's Command something Escape, right? But Control, Alt, Delete works with my message this morning. So we're going to go with the PC route. And I hope you guys can bear with me on this. But we know that Control, Alt, Delete is the answer on a PC when you see that, uh, what we call that spinning beach ball of death, right? That beach ball of death shows up on the screen. It's spinning around. It's accomplishing. You know that everything you just did is going to be lost. But you Control, Alt, Delete, try to save something by, by force quitting or whatever, right? See, when I was in elementary school, uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit. I, I was born in 1980, all right? So it's 2023. You can do the math, all right? There's something unique about people born right around my, my time. Because when you divide people generationally, you have uh, your baby boomers, all right? They were born from about 1946 to 1964. Do we have any proud baby boomers in the room? Not proud enough to shout, just, all right? <laughs> All right, it's me. All right, that's all right. Uh, so typically, Gen X is that uh, 1965 to 1979. Any Gen Xers in here? All right, a little, little prouder. Uh, typically, we put the label millennial on 1980 to 1997. Any millennials in here? All right. And then Gen Z, we got, you know, 1997 to 2010, Gen Z, all right? We got some Gen Z. We got now some other generation coming up behind you. I don't know what they're calling them, but here, there's actually a unique window of time where I said that Gen Z went to 1979 and millennials pick up in 1980. Well, there's some experts who actually take like a four or five year period of time, uh, 1978 to 1983, and have given that group of people a unique name, and they're called the Oregon Trail generation. Now, let me tell you why I prefer to associate as an Oregon Trail generation instead of millennial, okay? Oregon Trail Generation experienced like young childhood without cell phones, without computers, without the internet, without all that stuff. 
And they also experienced childhood with cell phones and with this new thing called the internet and with the computer in the home. And it was like this, like we didn't have any data on what was available on the internet and what you could accomplish and what was good and what was bad and all that. So this Oregon Trail generation, we kind of had to figure things out. Like it was a brand new thing for us. We got to experience kind of both sides of, of the computer and internet age. But one thing you learn very quickly, regardless, everyone in this room has got to know this by now. When you get that spinning beach ball of death, you hit control, alt, delete. And that's the step you're going to take to reset your computer, to start fresh, to, to wipe the RAM, right? To, to get, get going again. And so uh, what I've learned is that when you need to, to reset in life, when you need to get a fresh start, that control, alt, delete is actually something that's going to come in really helpful. So, with that in mind, if you want to reset your life, I'm going to give you the notes before I give you the notes, all right? So this is where we're going this morning. Number one, you have to give God control over your life. There's control. Number two, you need to alter some paths and patterns and habits, right? And then number three, you need to delete what shouldn't be there at all. So those are the three things we're going to talk about. If you need a reset in your life for 2023, if there's some areas that you're stuck in, well, what does the Bible say about how you get unstuck? And when you follow this control, alt, delete path, you're going to see that you can get unstuck and get that, that, that processor moving again. All right, so here's the first one we're going to talk about is how to reset your life. You need to give God control over your life. If you are stuck and you are not a follower of Jesus, I'm telling you right now, you are going to remain stuck. The very first thing you need to do if you want to get unstuck in your life, bring joy back into your life, find purpose, step outside of yourself and see something bigger than yourself, it starts by giving God control over your life. You say, I want God to call the shots. I want God to be in charge. I want God to do things because it's not working for me. In fact, I, I wrote this note. I love this. Your life is above your pay grade to run. Your life is way above your pay grade to run. And when you learn that and say, you know what? I'm stuck because I'm trying to get unstuck. I'm trying to control things. I'm trying to call the shots. I'm trying to figure out what's best for me. That's why you're stuck. You're spinning a bunch of wheels, but you're just getting deeper and deeper because you're refusing to give God control. Now, I'm going to read a whole bunch of Psalm 25. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to open up to Psalm 25. We're going to read the uh, 10 verses that kind of start off the chapter. And this is David writing this psalm, and it's David later on in his life. So keep that in mind as far as context, okay? And here's Psalm 25. Let's we'll start in verse 1. It says, O oh Lord, I give my life to you. I mean, right there. We're talking about if you want to get unstuck, you've got to give God control of your life. And David says right there, oh Lord, I give my life to you. He's taken the first finger of the reset process and he's put down on the control button. I'm giving control of my life over to God. But he goes on. I love how many times you're going to hear this concept of giving control over to God. He says, I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced. Or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. And then he says this, no one who trusts in you, in other words, no one who lets you control things will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. And then he says this in verse 4. He says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Again, you see right here this pattern of God, take control of my life. You decide if you, I turn to the right. You decide if I turn to the left. You decide if I go forward. God, I want you to show me which way to go. And then he says, lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. In other words, all day long, I let you control my steps. Verse 6 says, Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. 
Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. And then he says in verse 8, The Lord is good and does what's right. Why should we put our control, uh, why should we put God in control of our life? Why is it that it makes sense to give God control of your life? Well, David makes it really clear right here. The Lord is good and he does what's right. I don't know about you, but if I want someone uh, to, to drive me somewhere, I want to make sure that that person who's driving the car, that the, you know, me and my family or whoever, like, I want to make sure that person knows the right way. Then they're not going to take us the wrong way, right? You don't get in a, an Uber and say, just, just make it up, right? You, you want to make sure that the person steering the car knows where to go. And David's saying, listen, the Lord is good and he does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. We're going to stop there. If you want to hear more about David's heart, remember David was called a man after God's own heart. And if this is David later on in his life because he's talking about the rebellious sins of his youth, this is David looking back and understanding that the only path towards joy, the only path towards an abundant life is simply put to give control of his life over to God. And I want to encourage you, if you are stuck, the first button you need to press this morning is control. Give control of your life over to God. Think about it this way. Where God has an opinion, yours is irrelevant. Where God has an opinion, yours is irrelevant. When you give control of your life over to God, you say, God, whatever you want, I recognize and trust that it's good, and I'm going to do it your way, even if I don't like it. And like I said, for many of us, we're already followers of Christ, but we're having a really hard time giving control of our decisions over to God. We're still trying to sit there holding on to the steering wheel, making decisions about how we're going to get to where we're going. For, for you, we need to remember, as a follower of Christ, we let Christ lead so that we can follow. For those of you who have not even made a decision yet to follow Christ— to get unstuck, you got to take that first initial step of saying, I want to give God control over my life. And you start that relationship with him. Here's the second thing, how to reset your life, right? We got our finger on the control button. Now we're going to put our finger over on that alt button. And you got to alter some patterns and habits. In fact, if you think about it this way, the next step after Jesus has taken the wheel is to get out of the driver's seat. For a lot of us, right, we want to stay in the driver's seat. We want to kind of be in a place where uh, we still have like some access to some of the old ways we would do things. We know what speed we like to go. We know what way we like to go. We know what path, you know, what shortcut we want to take. We let Jesus kind of, all right, Jesus, you can take the wheel, kind of reach over and grab on the steering wheel. But at the end of the day, we're still calling the shots. And that's because we have some bad habits. We have some bad patterns that we need to break. And what happens if you don't break those bad habits and you don't break those bad patterns that even though you think you're giving control over to God to control your life, what you're going to slip back into is the old way of doing things because that's just the way your brain is wired. So what we need to do is we need to rewire our brain. We need to retool the neural pathways. You've probably heard of neural pathways before. This is a legitimate thing. It's pretty cool. But our brain actually has these little things that fire off, these little synapses, and they go a certain pathway. And what happens when you have a bad habit, all right, let's just take a bad habit. We know that when I see this, this thing always fires, and then I do this, and then this fires, and I do that, and this little pathway gets a rut in our brain. And what happens is we follow that same thought pattern every single time because we've built this little neural pathway in our brains. And oftentimes when it's a bad habit, 
what we find is that it's really hard to get out of that rut. It's really hard to get out of that neural pathway. So what we have to do is we have to alter our brain. We have to alter the way we think. We have to create a new way of thinking through things in a God-honoring way. We need to alter the way we think. In 1 Peter 1, verse 13, it says this. It says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Let me read that again. It says, so prepare your minds. In other words, do whatever you need to do in your own mind to recreate some neural pathways so that you are ready to do things the way God asks you to do them as he's controlling your life. But then it goes on and says, and exercise self-control. Learn how to, to take those thoughts captive, right? And as that thought enters your brain, and normally the synapse goes this way, you're saying, nope, I know that's not healthy. I'm going to force it another direction. I'm going to control my brain. I'm going to start learning and rethinking things a different way and create a new path. These neural pathways are really, really hard to reprogram. So we've got to ask ourselves, how do we do it? What does the Bible say about how do we reprogram the way we think? How do we take our thoughts captive? How do we create these new neural pathways? Think about this for a moment. There's a, um, a TikTok, uh, what are they called? Like when there's like a new thing on TikTok. It's like a trend? Trend the right word? All right. A new TikTok trend or a little challenge. I think it may be challenge is the word I'm looking for. Where... Uh, you, you film your, your dad as you tell him that you put diesel in the gas tank. Anybody seen the diesel gas prank? All right, so right now a lot of people are doing it. You get the camera set up. You get dad. You come into the room and you say, Dad, uh, yeah, I went and got gas in the car, but the, 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 the regular one was, uh, you know, had a bag over it, so I got the cheaper one cheaper one. Yeah, the green one. And you watch as dad is thinking, wait, what? You put diesel? But we all know, right, that you don't put diesel in an unleaded tank. In fact, if you didn't know that, I saved you a bunch of money. You don't ever put diesel in a car that doesn't take diesel. If you put bad stuff into the engine, you're going to cause problems. The same is true for the way your brain thinks. If you put bad stuff in, you're going to find that that's what you ruminate on. That's what you think about. Those are the patterns that you create. We have to understand that when you put junk in, you get junk out. So this is what Philippians 4.8 says about this. All right, so we're, remember, we're asking the question, how do we train our mind for action? How do we exercise self-control? How do we create new neural pathways? Philippians 4 says this. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. In other words, what he says is what you need to do is you need to stop putting diesel in your unleaded tank. Quit putting the wrong thing in. And you need to replace it with what's good. You need to take what's good and pure and lovely and kind and admirable. You need to take that and fill your mind with it. He says, think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then he says this, keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me. In other words, you've got to now take good things and put them in. You need to replace the junk. All right, think about this in a kind of a, 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 a math problem for just a moment. You need to replace the junk that you were putting in. Okay, so replace is number one, and then you're going to add into that a rep repetition. You need to repeat what you've replaced. So you put the good stuff, what's admirable, you spend time in God's word, you spend time, instead of looking at a, a bunch of junk and putting a bunch of crap in your, your brain and looking at things and, and just filling up your mind with all sorts of junk, you're going to replace it with what's good and what's admirable and all those things. You're going to replace those things, and then you're going to repeat that. It says right here, right? You're going to keep putting into practice. Keep doing it. You need to create some new patterns and some new habits. And then when you got to the point where you've replaced plus repeat, what you're going to have is that you've rewired your brain. Quick little math problem for you. Replace what shouldn't be in your thought processes 
what you shouldn't be putting into your body and into your mind. Replace those things with what's good and then repeat those things over and over again. Spend time in God's word. Like right now, maybe that's the, uh, the resolution you need to make. You realize you're not spending any time putting the goodness and truth of God's word into your body. You need to consume that and then you need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And what happens when you take good and you repeat it, you're going to rewire the neural pathways. You're going to make better decisions. All right, so we got our finger on the control button. We got our finger on the alt button. The last one we need to press is the delete button. So number three, if you want to reset your life, you need to delete what shouldn't be there at all. Have you noticed that typically when you get that spinning beach ball of death on your computer, there's a lot of things that could be going on that cause your computer to crash like that. Usually, what probably what's happening is there might be some sort of a bug in the software that you're using, right? You've got yourself into a place where it's sending some sort of code on some sort of endless loop, and nothing is accomplished, being accomplished because there's, there's a bug, there's something bad about the application that's open. And the only way you're going to get your computer to operate again is to control, alt, delete, right, and force quit, just completely close out of that app completely, you got to get, get it off, or otherwise your computer is going to keep spinning, right? Another thing that can cause your computer to crash is when you're out of RAM, right? Random access memory, I think is what it stands for. When your computer is out of memory, it's out of space, you have so many things open that as it's trying to run the software that you have at that moment, it's saying, I don't have any, any bandwidth left. I don't have any space left to be able to run this app. So it's just sitting there spinning. And the only way to fix it is to control, alt, delete, and, and delete and force quit that app so that there's room to process and use the apps you got open. There's, there's things in life that we need to just recognize. They need to be deleted. And here's the, the kind of a category all these things fit into. Is a, specifically, we need to learn how to delete our past. Let me explain what I mean by this. These are things that are currently in your operating system. They're currently spinning around in your head. They're currently spinning around in your memory. And they're things that need to just be deleted altogether. And all of them tie back to your past in some way. Let me show you a couple examples of these. Number one is your past labels. Here's what I mean by this. <clears throat> it's been proven psychologically that a lot of us, we hang on to labels that were given to us early or often, All right? So if somebody's put a label on you when you were young, maybe someone told you when you were very young that you weren't very smart. And because they said that to you when you were early enough, they told that to you when you were young, that label has stuck you still today believe that you are not a very smart person. Maybe someone told you you were fat, or someone told you you were useless, or someone told you, I don't know, all sorts of labels, or maybe they put a good label on you, and it's still a label that shouldn't have stuck. They said, you know what? You are an excellent athlete, and you wore that label with so much excitement because someone put that on you while you were young that now you can't get, out, you can't get that label off of you. That's your, the, your whole identity is wrapped up in your athleticism. There's labels that other people put on us when we're young. There's also labels that people put on us often enough, even today, right? If you hear the same thing often enough, you, be, you begin to believe it. And you wear these labels around. You believe what other people say about you. You know one of the worst offenders of putting labels on you is you. You're actually, and my, myself, like when we look into a mirror, I'm really good at labeling myself. I'm good at looking at some things I don't like and taking little stickers and putting them all over me and giving myself all sorts of names. And what happens is we walk around with a false identity that other people have given to us, that we've given to ourselves, and we walk around not labeled properly. Because if you want to understand what you got to do, you got to drop all those labels. It doesn't matter if someone thinks you're stupid. It doesn't matter if someone thinks you're ugly. It doesn't matter if someone thinks you're useless. None of those labels come from this book, I'll tell you. 
None of them come from here. You want to see some labels that you got to stick on you, you go to the book of Ephesians and read the book of Ephesians. It's going to label you properly. It's going to tell you that you are a masterpiece. It's going to tell you that you've been adopted and chosen into sonship, that God picked you, that you are loved and that you are lovely. These are the labels that we need to hang on to because they come from God We need to to delete those old labels. We need to get rid of them because they're not from God and put on ourselves only the labels that God has given to us in his word. We need to walk forward with a proper real identity. Here's another thing you need to delete. You need to delete past hurts. Some of you right now, you got these things spinning. You're stuck in this loop. You're replaying something that somebody did to you, something that maybe you did to you, the some way that you've been hurt or hurt someone, and you're just living in that past. And it's just playing on loop. And you are stuck because someone has this grip on you, and they do not have authority to have that kind of a grip on you. I wrote down, it says, don't give people who have hurt you that kind of control over your life. Forgive them and move on. Here's what Matthew 6 says. It says, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Now here, let me explain what this means. What it means is that when you understand the grace of and the mercy that has been shown to you by God. When you say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life, I recognize that you are giving me a gift of a relationship with you and an eternity with you that I do not deserve. I recognize that you have shown me tremendous forgiveness, and you give your life over to him. That in that moment, in recognizing how great that gift was given to you, that you are now going to want to show that grace and mercy to others. You're going to want to not live in that past. You're going to want to say, you know what? I don't give you that kind of control over my life. You hurt me, but I forgive you, and I'm moving on. I know you owe me a ton of money, and it's caused this really weird rift between us, and we're stuck, but I know I'm just going to forgive it, and I'm moving on. I don't, I don't, you see what I'm saying? There are these pasts that we have been hurt and we, we live in it. We got to delete those. Here's a, another past that we need to, to move on from is a past sin. You notice I put in here, and current. In other words, we need to take some of the sin that all of us, uh, I make it sound like some of us don't have any current sin issues. The truth is all of us have sin issues that we're currently dealing with and things that are from our past, and we're hanging on to those things, but the Bible is really clear. If you want to get unstuck, you got to take everything from your life from the past that you shouldn't have done, that you did, it's done, it's over, it's, it, and take it and say, God, I know that you've forgiven me. I know you have a better and bigger plan for my life. I'm going to take that and hand it over to you and ask for forgiveness and just It's gone. Put it away. And as far as the things that you're doing right now in your life, every single one of us, there's not anyone who's exempt from this in the room. You can think. You don't have to think very hard. There's certain things in your life right now that you know don't belong. They're not supposed to be there. It's going to be something a little different for every one of us. But if we want to get unstuck, we have to take that sin Put it in the past, and then move on. Delete it. We can't keep living in it. We can't keep repeating it. We got to take our sin and make it a past tense thing. That we got to listen. We're always going to have a struggle every day. We're going to have those moments where we do something like, "Man, why did I do that again?" We, when those things happen, right? We we process them from an attitude of repentance, and we say, "God." I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to put it in the past. I'm going to thank you for forgiving it. And I'm going to do better next time. 1 John 1.9 says this. It says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Would you all say that verse with me out loud? You ready? It says, but if 
we confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. See, we need to put our finger on the control button. We need to put our finger on that alt button. And we need to put our finger on the delete button. We need to give God control of our life. We need to alter those patterns and those habits that need to be rewired. And then we need to delete what doesn't belong in our life at all. Delete the, the things from our past. Put things that are in our present that don't belong there in our past. And delete them. So here's my challenge for all of us this morning. We always end our messages at ACC with a simple three-word prayer. And it goes like this. What now, God? And I pray that when you see these words, that you do the same thing that, that hopefully all of us do, which is a, a simple moment of saying, God, what do you want me to do with this information? I believe that when we open your word, that David did show a sign, that he showed us his heart, that, that was after your own heart, that David was showing us what it looks like to long to give God control over his life. God, I believe that when I, I look at scripture, I see these, these, these commands that say that I'm supposed to alter the way I think and to build new, new neural pathways so that I can process things better in the future. And God, I, I recognize that I'm supposed to delete my past hurts and labels and sins and put the things that I'm doing right now, put them in the past and delete them. What should I do with that, God? Here's what I want to challenge you to, to ask these three questions. If you haven't written anything down this morning, I want to ask you to write these three things down. Or if you're really fancy, you could just take a picture of the screen. All right, here you go. Number one, where are you still trying to control your life? Number two, what do you need to replace and repeat until things get rewired? And number three, what labels, hurts, and sin do you need to delete? These questions right here are, I think, really a really good diving board into 2023. You stand on the end of that diving board and you look down and the water looks refreshing, the water looks good, and you're wanting to really kind of jump into 2023 with something good and something exciting. You got to ask yourself these three questions. And I hope that what you can do is answer each of these today. Maybe sit down with a spouse or someone, maybe a parent, someone you care about, and say, hey, I'm trying to process through these questions, but answer each of these questions today. And once you have those answers, put your finger on that Control-Alt-Delete button and get a fresh start for 2023. Where are you still trying to control your life? What do you need to replace and repeat until things get rewired? And what labels hurts and sins do you need to delete let's pray father thank you so much for lovingly and graciously caring about us so much that you've given us this this simple truth from your word that one of the best things we could ever do as followers of you is to just simply let you drive let you control things. Let you call the shots. And as we give control of our life over to you, we recognize that things need to get rewired, that we need to move some things around in the way we think through things. God, we need to delete the things that have us stuck. And so I pray that as a church, you'd help us process through these questions, help us make some good uh, decisions, and to walk into 2023 with just a ton of momentum as we move forward unstuck from the rut we were in. God, we ask that you would show us a tremendous blessing in those decisions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. 
please remember this. You belong at ACC.